Welcome everyone, welcome back. It's been like two weeks since I've done an interview because I've taken a little bit of a break, but we're coming back with a bang. Chet Zar, um, you're an incredible like dark arts sort of designer. You've done prosthetics, um, really interesting artist. Like I see all the, the cool shit you got over there, but um, <laughs> the super influential and extremely loved, especially in where you are, like in, in the horror scene, I guess you could call it. <laughs> yeah. But, um, <laughs> It's an honor and a pleasure to have you, man. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So um, the first thing I really want to talk about is the the connection between like music and um, horror. Like, why do you mm. think there is such a such a strong link, especially even even in, in like um, more mainstream bands? Like you see you see Metallica and um, Kirk Hammett has like, you know, the, uh, the guitars with only horror like references mm -hmm. and stuff. Why do you think that is so big? Well, I think it's more of a a connection between horror and metal, mm -hmm. you know, because it's it's seems like it's primarily been embraced by the metal crowd, yeah. um, uh, mostly. And uh, if you think about, <clears throat> you know, what what metal is and what horror movies are, it's like they're kind of these sub genres of mainstream su sub genres of mainstream genres. Yeah. They're kind of outsidery. You know, they're interested more of the dark side of things. Um, so it makes sense to me. You know, it makes total sense to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really cool that uh, the horror yeah. scene is getting more out there because, you know, with the with uh, like Nirvana, I don't know, you see all like the teenagers with Nirvana shirts on. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they're supporting, but they're still supporting Nirvana. Right. <laughs> and with the same thing with like, I go into Target and I only see like Metallica horror shirts. Mm -hmm. like crazy gore and then it's like i saw a slayer shirt in metallic in um target which is wild. Oh, that's crazy it's crazy but like yeah when i was your age th this was completely uh unimaginable <laughs> i would never have imagined that like a mainstream store like target would be carrying Slay slayer t-shirts it's kind of incredible yeah, no, but no. but it's like you know i've always sort of um approached this whole dark art thing like <clears throat> all the dark artists, the people that like are into monsters, the horror fans, they're all the, the super nice, like the nicest people. I'm a vegetarian. I haven't eaten meat in 30 years. I'm an animal okay. lover. Uh, you know, it's like all, all the, and, and everybody in the community is like this. And so I just thought it's so strange because people see our artwork and they think we're evil a lot of times or crazy or something. Maybe older people, probably not younger people, but um, uh, so with my because i have a podcast called the dark art society podcast and it's Great like podcast, by the way oh thanks thanks um i interview like other dark artists and just artists in general but mostly dark artists with the intention of kind of like helping uh, supporting the dark art community for one thing since we're a bit marginalized and people don't you know take a lot of times they don't take us seriously but we're making art as cool as any other art you know mm -hmm. um maybe cooler some would say oh, <laughs> um but but I just uh, thought that was the most um, one of the most interesting aspects of dark art is that the people are so nice that um, that it deserved to be appreciated by kind of the mainstream or by more people. So I'm trying to like show that hey we're not evil <laughs> we're cool <laughs> by doing these interviews and showing how nice these people are you know and just sort of I, I joke I joke around and, and say spreading the good news of dark art. Um, so anyway, that's sort of my take on it. Uh, I think I completely agree. Uh, like <laughs> at the tool show, um, I met like the nicest people I've ever met at a concert. Crowd, right. And they're all like, you know, I saw like a com someone completely gothed out with all the mm. makeup and they were just super nice and considerate. <laughs> and like, you know, they gave Taylor Swift bracelets and um, I got like a, a hoodie and I wore uh -huh. it to school. And the first thing someone told me is um, tool satanic. Yeah, Ooh, I hate <laughs> it's crazy. Someone, someone came up to me and was like, "You know, that's demonic, right?" Yeah, and it's I don't know. It's crazy <laughs> to think that in a world where everything is so like we're so open to everything and everything you do, it's okay. We we support you, except right. for like stuff that's a little bit scary, a little bit right. Weird, and everyone right. runs away. Yeah, yeah. It's it is weird. It's weird, and it's just you know, it's and the other the other point I like to make too about the whole dark art movement is that 
and this goes for metal and stuff as well i think any or horror movies it's like there is a you know there's a darkness in the world you know it's part of life is like yeah. there is good and there is bad stuff you know we see these wars going on it's you know poverty there's just like there is evil in the world and it's and but creating art that kind of highlights the dark side of life is not a bad thing. It's a good thing because it sort of um, allows, it helps people to deal with the darkness of reality in a way that is safe because it's just a piece of art or a movie or a song, you know, and, and it sort of helps people to confront the, the real life negativity in the world in a healthy way. And it's like, if more people expressed their darkness through art, perhaps we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in now, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that also goes back to like, people are almost you know, too scared. They mm -hmm. don't yeah. embrace the horror. And right. you know, there is a, a crap load of horror. It sucks, but it is. And so, you know, seeing like your awesome paintings would make, makes other people feel, you know, okay. Right. You always, you know, you do what, like the most crazy monsters and like, things that is super creative and then you look at it and it just i don't know gives gives um inspiration that there are still yeah. people who are super creative out there who are doing weird stuff or doing cool stuff and putting it out i mean yeah. it's great keeping the flame up right yeah i agree and you know that's i know when when i've been going through difficult times in my life it was always you know music that was there for me to keep me going especially like some of the darker stuff that that made me feel like, oh, I'm not crazy. Other people feel this way. You know, other people are feeling bummed about what's going on. And it, and it, and it helps you like get through the tough times and it helps you, it helps you realize you're not alone, which is really one of the most important aspects of art is it's kind of like as artists, we're sort of reaching out to other people. We're reaching out to people and telling them you're not alone, which is like a powerful thing, you know, especially in this world where we're all kind of cut off from each other due to cell phones and social media and yeah. we don't have these like real connect as much real connections as we used to have um so i think it's it's a it's a um a service a public service in a way <laughs> i mean if we had more public service i mean yeah and, you know, <laughs> i don't know it's like the art that I, if anything art should be more of a public service right because it's like you can't make a living being a musician anymore like, I know. You know it's crazy. Living wages have like what um minimum wage stayed the exact same. Mm -hmm. And yet everything's gotten more and more expensive. And there's more and more demand of music. But at the same time, you know, like I've, almost all the musicians I've talked to have been like, Well, I still gotta work another job just to make Yeah. This, which is why like it's such a yeah, yeah. It's a bummer. It's a, I I was I I'm a musician also. And before I got into painting. Uh, you know, I started out like around your age, get it, I got interested in makeup effects and we're talking like, let me see, that would be 19, like, uh, 80 long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really into makeup and learning how to do all these monsters. Cause I was like into monster movies and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, I got into makeup effects and I was like, okay, I can do this job. My, my stepfather was a fine artist, a painter, like I am now. And I just saw how, what a struggle it was for him to make a living as an artist. So I thought I really love makeup effects and movies. So, and this is a career where I can make a decent living. So I went into that and um, did that for 20 years, mm. worked on all these movies. And then I got like burnt out on that and un creatively unsatisfied. And then I went to uh, painting and I got, and I was like, okay, I'm going to be a fine artist. I can make whatever I want. I want to have art directors directing me and stuff. But while that was happening, uh, when I was younger, when I was getting into effects, I was also in a band <clears throat> and I was really into that, really into music. And that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to get like a career in music. I tried for about 10 years and we never quite made it. And, uh, and it was such a disappointment at the time. It was heartbreaking when, when the band broke up for the last time and I'm like, okay, I got to move on because this isn't working, but it was such a blessing because it's so hard to make money. It's impossible to make money in music now. Yeah. And it's like at the time, you know, I, like 98 is when the last time 
my my band was together and at the time we didn't see what was coming in 98 yeah. we didn't see how the music industry was going to change so it was really i was lucky that i kind of didn't put all my eggs in that basket and didn't make it in music because i ended up you know uh creating a, a career that i can barely survive on <laughs> I mean, it's still hard to make money as an artist of any kind. Yeah, uh, but I'm able to do it. Yeah, it's it's crazy because like, you know, there's all these amazing bands that um, will put out like two records and never show up again because mm -hmm. you can't make it. And I mean, in a in a sense, it's I don't want to say it like you know, but turn a negative into a positive. It's great that you weren't in the music because now we all have <laughs> all this you know sick ass art. But at the same time, like. You know, Chet Zar at Madison Square Garden, you know? Yeah, like, right. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. And and just, you know, the idea of being paid to, to write music just sounds like a dream to me. But, oh, yeah. that, you know, that's not really the reality anymore. Um, it would have been great. But, you know, I it's fun. The funny thing is I ended up, you know, turning to fine art, like being a painter. Mm -hmm uh after being creatively unsatisfied in the film industry because i was like i was a pair of hands i was sculpting sculpture cool. sculptor mostly and um and that's a great amazing job pays well but at the at the end of the day you're a pair of hands for someone else's vision and so they're like make it look like this make it look like this and and more often than not there's they're like make it look like the last movie that made money and that's just not as fun as trying to come up with something really cool and amazing, you know, with working for someone like Guillermo del Toro, who, who oh, wants, he's awesome. yeah, he's amazing. Like he wants cool, new, interesting ideas, but he's the exception and not the rule. Same with working with tool. It was like, you know, when you work up with tool on a music video, it's going to be cool. You just, <laughs> it's like, you don't have to worry about that, but 95% of the movies you're working on are just like, you know, you're being art directed by, money people and producers and stuff like that. So it just wasn't uh, creatively satisfying. Um, so anyway, point being is that when I realized I could be a painter, maybe get into fine art, I it was like kind of a, an epiphany I had. Was like, that's what I, that's the first thing I wanted to be in my life was an artist, a fine artist. Like in the first grade, I was fantasizing about being a, an artist you know because i used to draw all the time and paint and stuff and so i just kind of forgot about that original dream you know because i got into other stuff i got into movie making when i was a kid i got into music i got into makeup effects and um i ended up coming back to the to the the thing that i was which is a fine artist you know a painter it's kind of what i was meant to be but it just was like i had to go through all these different <laughs> this roundabout way to get there, you know? But like it, it adds to it, you know? Like if there's mm -hmm. a, let's say there's a, um, a really rich dude who is no struggle, you know, like a trust fund kid and becomes mm -hmm. a, a painter. Whereas someone who, uh, right. you know, someone who was, you know, in a worse situation, had to build themselves up. I would say that, you know, like a hundred percent of the time, totally. the art was like struggle translates into better art. Not Absolutely. to say that, you know, happiness can also be great art, but like tool, <laughs> mm -hmm. like all the, the shitty parts of life get turned into amazing songs. Yeah. And more people resonate with that because we're all yeah. having, you know, COVID all gave us a terrible time. Right. And uh, going back to the movies, mm -hmm. it's really interesting now because, you know, like Disney's been, Disney especially has been doing that thing where they would make, they get a movie that's really successful and they just keep doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And people are getting sick of it. Like, it's really interesting. I know. People are, you know, like, they're also making worse movies, which also doesn't help. But right, people are sick of it. And, I mean, maybe that will be a catalyst for better movies. Like, a, maybe 2024 is the year. We're going to get a, a renaissance back with, like, I mean, A24, you know, the movie studio. Where yeah. They're really bringing back the roots of, of movie making. And so I guess, like you said, in a roundabout way, we did have to, we had to go through some struggles, but we're at the, the point where it seems like the best time to make great art. And, yeah, um, I agree. I really want to, I want to talk about like your tool thing, right? So you did prosthetics and Adam Jones also worked in the movie field. Is mm -hmm. that how you guys like crossed paths? Or? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's how we met. Um, I was working, this was like early 1990 or something. Um, it was, I was working at a shop. He was working in another department at the shop and we just kind of met and hit it off. And we liked the similar kinds of music. And actually he was like, yeah, I'm trying to start a band, you know? <laughs> and I was like, me too. I'm starting to try to start a band too. And we actually jammed together at one point, him playing bass, <laughs> me playing guitar. Uh, yeah, it was great. It was awesome. But, um, and th the next thing I know, it's like, I hear, oh, he's leaving the industry. Yeah. We, we kind of, we're just, be we're friends. And then he moved on to another shop, which is like people in effects always bounce around to different shops. Like you work somewhere two weeks or two months or three months, go to another shop. It's just the nature of the business. Mm -hmm. And then I hear, Oh, he's, he left the business and he's in this band. And, um, everyone was, everyone at his job was like, don't do it. You're not going to make it. Don't do it. Everyone at the shop he's working at. That's what I heard. Next thing I know, they're on the radio and I'm like, holy shit, that's Adam. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the rest is history. So I, he just, he got back in touch with me, um, around the time of the, uh, uh, their, uh, second album, I think the Anima, Anima album, um, stink fist, the song. And he asked me to come in and work like, do some onset makeup stuff just to sort of help out. And then after that, he uh, hired me to do like, you know, head the makeup effects department, puppets and stuff. And then I did some, I was also into computer, getting into computer animation at the time. So I did a bunch of li live visuals, computer looping, computer animation. You probably saw them if you saw Tool Alive because they still use a lot of them. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the highlights. And um, I don't know, people that are tuning into this, heard me say the same story last week or couple, whatever when I, but um I, I snuck to the front me and my dad snuck to the front mm -hmm. security they, for some reason they didn't have security in the lower level so we, we just um right like a minute before tool started we went from our uh, cheapo seats and we moved to the front and we were on the side stage but like uh -huh. the very front and the side stage and I, I mean I have to say the visuals are incredible but like when you're up close, the visuals combined with like a Justin Chancellor going back and forth and then Mater running in circles and Adam mm -hmm. staring at you, it's it's something else. And yeah, yeah. Just hitting those drums. It's it's an it's incredible experience. experience. Yeah. Get from other bands. And yeah. I, mean, I appreciate you for building onto it, but it's crazy. Absolutely. Like, I tell it, yeah, I tell everybody it's like you, you have to see them at least once. Yeah. You can't explain it. You know, you, you don't, you can't explain it. You just have to go see them because it really is. It's an experience. It's amazing what they've done. And Adam's got, you know, he's, he's a, he's got a great visual. He's got a great eye for visual art and he's very visually minded. Um, so, you know, he's sort of like the, I think he's kind of the art director of the band and he's just, you know, I, I discovered a lot of my favorite artists through him because he's always kind of like, on the cutting edge of, of art and stuff, you know, and, and yeah. music, he'd always turn me on to bands before they got big too. He was just like one of those guys. I don't know if you know, okay. I've known like people like that all my life, you know, in high school, there was always like this one kid that knew all the cool bands before anybody else. <laughs> and he would give you like a mixtape back in the day. Um, Adam's kind of like that. He's, he's got an amazing eye for that stuff. So he knows what's good. You know, and that's the that's the most important skill in being an artist is knowing what is good, like having good taste and knowing what is going to work for your project, you know? Yeah, I mean, and also you jamming with, with Adam Jones must have been <laughs> wild, but I can see. What yeah, but we were just like young dudes. <laughs> we didn't. He wasn't a famous rock star. I wasn't a famous rock star. We were just makeup effects nerds. <laughs> that liked music jamming. So it's like, you know, you look back on it and you're like, Whoa, I was jamming with this rock star, but he wasn't a rock star at the time. He was just a dude, <laughs> you know, it's always the most, like you also, you see him, you have the, the rock star complex just because the most artistic people, um, people who have like the weird thoughts and the, and the pushing the cutting edge ideas are always the sort of dudes that would, you don't seem like they'd be on tool. You don't, seem like they would break it like a song like prison sex like mm -hmm. what the hell <laughs> you would not think <laughs> that that gets famous but 
I right. Mean, we are. Yeah, and, yeah. And um, I mean, I can't imagine all the good music. Uh, we've ta- touched on this, but I can't imagine all the good music that falls down a hole and never gets discovered i know i know some i know i can think of two okay three i can think of three bands off the top of my head that are amazing that just never made it that nobody knows about unless you're in la you might have heard uh heard them a couple times amazing bands and it's like it's like that all over the country and all over the world Mm -hmm. you know and, and that's kind of the, for me, like discovering bands is usually just like a rabbit hole, but also like the, the importance of festivals, I think. Mm-hmm. Festivals yeah. can also be really terrible. Like when you have yeah. the Coachella, whatever the Coachella um, Golden Voice. Right. Whenever they're doing these really stupid one day festivals and it's really terribly run, that's something else. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah. When you can see 30 minutes of every single great metal artist for like 50 bucks. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and then yeah. you get to discover these new bands. Like, I'm I'm going to a festival, my first festival, and that's why I'm discovering, um, like smaller indie bands. Certainly not metal, but then also mm-hmm. like heavier emo acts, just because they're there, and it's it's great. Yeah, it's- yeah, it's cool. I'm not even like uh, I'm not even primarily a metal guy myself. I, I'm like more of a, I my uh, I don't know. I like all kinds of music, but I kind of came up in the '70s with classic rock and then discover punk music in the early 80s and um i was always it was seemed like in high school because everything's like clicks in high school there was always like the punks and the metal guys and i was kind of more like a punk but kind of a weirdo artist who kind of hung out with some of the punks i wasn't fully into it then but then when i got out of high school I, i discovered like bands like dead kennedys and 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 uh just totally got into it and like, wow, this is amazing, amazing stuff. Um, but that, that was the cool, one of the cool things about the punk shows is they were like $5 and you'd see these amazing bands that are now like classic punk bands, like black flag and, and stuff. And, uh, yeah, it was like five bucks, $7 or whatever. <laughs> that, that, that's the dream. Cause like, <laughs> it's like the, the DOCs, right? Like I interviewed John Dwyer, um, couple weeks ago he's awesome and they're like really driving that punk and that hardcore not hardcore more like garage but that like Mm -hmm. driving music then even now i think those tickets are like 20 bucks 30 bucks yeah yeah that's cheap for now that's like cheap for now for nowadays yeah 30 bucks i can get like i can get like a well like two meals at wendy's i can get like (laughs) and i know it's i'm not i don't want to shade docs at all because that's really cheap for concerts nowadays right right but like there's a there's an interview of, of Kurt Cobain talking about how Madonna charges 60 bucks for concerts in yeah. the 90s <laughs> and how they only charge like 15 bucks. Yeah. I just got to think like what would these old punkers like I know Black, Black Flag is making a like a, a resurgence almost now. Mm-hmm. But like what would they think of like $30 concert tickets or like $60 yeah, concert right. tickets or right. Like um trying to think what's like a crazy priced concert i mean i guess oh, the, like tool yeah yeah i heard like, those I tickets pay were a couple bucks hundred balcony tickets where you couldn't right. see them at all right oh, bucks man yeah yeah it's like i i someone was telling me he went and it was like 250 bucks or something and i mean it's a lot of money and it's an it's an incredible it's an experience you know right yeah yeah say, that's the thing for tool it's like you can kind of go, okay, it's worth that much money because yeah. it's amazing, but most bands aren't giving you that kind of show. Yeah. You know, I think there's, there's very few bands. I think OCs too are definitely up there with, I would definitely pay like 30 bucks to see them. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. They're great. But they're a great band. There's a, uh, what are you saying? Oh, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, oh, I I for, that, um, go ahead. There's always these crazy, you know, uh, bands that are really worth seeing, but then on the other spectrum, there's, you know, kind of mid bands that mm-hmm. wouldn't pay um to see but oh you talked about you you know listen to music are you a swans kind of guy are you seeing um, like- <laughs> yeah i mean i that's the kind of the era and the the kind of style i never told i mean i've heard the swans mm-hmm. but i never got um i never bought any albums or anything i never totally got into them but it's like you know 
in, in that direction is where I was musically when I was sort of coming of age, like 18 years old or so. Um, I tended, I, I was, I was really into like the Minutemen, the span, the Minutemen, um, uh, no means no. If you haven't heard no means no, and you're a music fan, you have to listen to no means no. It's amazing. I always, I tell everybody, <laughs> they're like there, this yeah. totally underrated band that, uh, um is just incredible they're so they're just so underrated and so amazing so so you need to check out no check out no means now no. check out the album an album called wrong and it's on youtube no means no wrong check it out when you get a chance sure. um but yeah it was like butthole surfers and you know it was like all these we it was like these weirdo bands that kind of were sort of more on the punk side of things that that i was into you know like we listen to college radio state kxl use a college station we used to listen to back when i was working on the blob the the movie blob uh, yeah, movie yeah. in 1988 87 we'd always be listening to the, like the college music station so it'd be all the kind of independent stuff mm. oh i know what i was gonna say um have you heard of the band fugazi yeah of course man yeah they used to do um and i think probably the 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 their band before that which was minor threat which was a hardcore band yeah, that's awesome they, yeah, they they uh uh they they were on Discord Records, which is Ian MacKay's the singer's record label, and they would only sell their CDs for six dollars, I think, or twelve dollars. It was it was like half the price of what major labels were selling their albums for, because they were like they're just ripping you off. This is they only cost this much to make. You know, when you do retail you just double the amount or when you do wholesale it's like wholesale price is half the amount that you pay in the store and the record companies are ripping you off so they would print on their records like don't pay more than six dollars for this record <laughs> which i which i thought was pretty cool you That's know great. it's it's beautiful to see that the punk rockers still standing up but like i don't know nowadays you see the um like the older bands like the bands i really have a lot of respect for and they're doing stupid shit like $500 for pit tickets. Like I have a crap load of respect for bands like Metallica who are still more commercial, right? But mm -hmm. dude, no one, like who's paying $500 to see Metallica? I know, I know. Like I get Metallica's great, but five, I can't, I can't even wrap my hand. Like these bands that would have boycotted. Yeah, have I know. I think like, it's, I, I think it's got something to do with like ticket master and, oh, the, yeah, and, the, master. and the whole like uh monopolization of ticket prices i think it's more of like it's kind of more of a corporate issue you know uh, and, and where these huge corporations are just screwing people and it, it's sort of like but bands like that have to kind of play the game to satisfy the amount of people that they that are are fans of theirs you know what I mean? They can't play a small club or the club will, the whole town will riot you know, or whatever. It'd be like people out on the street. So it seems kind of like this part of this sort of corrupt system. They can't really do anything about, but I don't, I don't really know the ins and outs of it. No, that's really, it's... really interesting. And um, me and my dad was having a conversation about like inflation and corporate greed. Cause if you see inflation, like the, what it was from like the nineties to now mm -hmm. still is cheaper than what things are actually now. So then where is that right. extra, like 10 bucks coming from? Like, yeah, it's only like 2.5%. And I'm not like an econ person, so don't right. think it's me. But I think it was only like 2.5% more than it was, what it was in like the 90s or like yeah. two around there. But then like, where's the extra 20 bucks coming from? It's corporate. It's I know, I know. And it's like, and, and it's like that's the thing. Here's the, the here's the, to, to, to bring it back around to dark art too. You know, we get hassled and saying we're evil and demonic. Right. Whereas that's the demonic shit. That's the evil stuff is super rich people screwing everybody so that they could have more. It's just pure greed. And that is what's bad. Yet they're respected members of society. They're job creators. You know, they get like all the perks of being wealthy. And, and it's like, that's the real evil that's happening. It's not people making monsters and making dark metal songs. <laughs> It's it's um also really interesting because they they really um they put it behind religion and I don't mm -hmm. want to alienate people but they put it behind their religion and their family and things that people can relate to right whether right. and a, a lot of these um 
like metal people or rockers, maybe like atheists, maybe in religions that are slightly less known or less appreciated. And then so they don't get that um that like major I don't know, they don't they don't get the uh, backing. Whereas mm-hmm, if it's like right. a if I'm a terrible corporate person, but I'm part of the majority and I say, well, yes to the biggest religion I support mm-hmm. you, then everyone's happy. Then yeah, no one yeah. looks behind me, you know, and like the mega pastors of Christianity. Like mm-hmm. there's if you believe in Christianity or not, like I'm Hindu. I don't I'm I'm I don't even believe in Christianity, right? I still yeah. respect Hind- it. Hinduism's like, awesome, man. I love the Hinduism. <laughs> and the the mega pastors and like do, would Jesus want that? Yeah, I know. That's it's just so obvious too. It's like they look, you're 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 a 14 year old kid and you can see it. It's like <laughs> it's you know, it's like a kid crazy. can see it. Anybody could see it. It's right in your face. It's not like some secret conspiracy <laughs> yeah. under the surface. It's like it doesn't need to be. It's just obviously so dumb and flies in the face of the whole teachings of Jesus. It's just yeah. absolutely ridiculous. And it's you know, the world you're it's so weird you being a kid growing up in this crazy world, you know, cause it's like, I remember when I was your age and I remember what the times were like, and it was just so different. And um, you're kind of, you're kind of growing up in this world where you can't really rely on anything. Yeah. It's like, the, you know, when I was growing up, if a person got a job, they had security basically for the rest of their lives. And then they got retirement in the end. It's like, nobody has that anymore. It's just not there anymore. And things are changing so fast with technology. Um, They're just changing before you even get a chance to like know what's going on. They change again, which is kind of why so many people are going crazy, I think, in the world. But, um, you know, the only way to deal with it is to kind of like take this Zen approach, I think, and like stay centered. Don't get too attached to anything and just kind of like try and surf the wave of reality and go like, with things and you know instead of like not getting rigid in your beliefs like you know i think the people that are having trouble now like the the extremists are the people that like they see all this change going on mm-hmm. and they're like they get super rigid in their beliefs and they're not going to look at anything else and i think the answer is the opposite the answer is like you have to be more less rigid in the way you think and more understanding and trying to you know just kind of like it's a different approach to how you live your life you know what i mean yeah yeah that's I completely agree you know i gotta go with the flow queens of the yeah mm-hmm. and um for the people you know for people who are really rigid maybe he's gotta you know do some dark arts maybe he's gotta yeah exactly <laughs> loosen <it> up <laughs> express some of that darkness you'll be okay okay so again so we have six minutes and like 30 seconds ish. Cause I, I'm not spending three bucks, four bucks a month for zoom. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so we got six minutes, 30 seconds. And okay. this is my last question that I love to do with everyone. Cause it really, I don't know, opens it up. Okay. Mm-hmm. You got to give me three. Um, it can be any three, anything, right? Three albums, three songs. It's just three things mm-hmm. that can change someone's life. So you can do a song, it's whatever, however you want to interpret it. Mm-hmm. But like some people have said, you know, I'll do a song, I'll do an album, I'll do a book. I'll do an artist, I'll do an influence, whatever. Or you can okay. do three artists and three paintings, whatever you want, man. Okay. Okay, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I will do three uh, spiritual thinkers. Oh, hell yeah. Alan Watts, uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti, and... What's the third one? Uh, Manly P. Hall. All three of these guys you should look up, especially Alan Watts. If you're not familiar with Alan Watts, um, he's got a million videos. He's dead now, but a million videos of like basically about Zen type philosophy on YouTube. They're really good. I bet you'll appreciate it. They're re- they're really interesting. And uh, Krishnamurti was... Uh, 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 a really great, amazing spiritual teacher that was brought up to be the Messiah of the world, the savior of the world, handpicked in India. He was handpicked by this mystical group called the Theosophical Society, and they basically took him and raised him to be the Messiah. And as soon as he became of age, he's like, 
fuck this shit. Every, there is no path. Everyone has to learn their own way. And then he just went on to be kind of like a teacher of, of just a lecturer. Really amazing. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And then Manly P. Hall wrote this amazing book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages, where he went all over, everywhere in the world, studied every religion. He did this when he was like 21, too, which is crazy. Uh, he went all over the world, studied all the world's religions, the, their uh, magical ceremony, any kind of spiritual stuff. Mm -hmm. And he put he found all the common denominators and put that all in this one book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages, which is really incredible. So wow. those are my three. Wow, I appreciate it. I'm going <laughs> to check that out for sure because I love reading the um, the weird, you know, the weird, the uh, spiritual stuff, especially mm -hmm. I'm really interested in like, um, what's it, uh, psychedelic drugs. Mm -hmm. like I definitely want to do some research on uh, psilocybin when I get older and whatever, because I think that's really interesting. The idea of ego death. Yeah. Like, your own path. So but funny. You, remi you remind me of myself when I was your age, I swear. <laughs> it sounds weird, but I, I was the same way. I was like super responsible. I was not doing any drugs and I waited until I was an adult. I read about them. I waited till I was an adult. And then I did my experimentation and all for the right reasons. I was not like a party party or yeah, yeah. druggy guy. The, the party drugs are, that's like the not a great way to go but I no think it's, if you can have these um like what you and me are having like civil talks about this right stuff. like my science teacher um a couple years back i didn't even have her she was just like at our school and we talked about almost i would say every thursday after school we just talked about um the effect of psychedelic drugs on mm -hmm. the brain just like whatever he's going these deep ass conversations about you know the idea like how how it, did it happen? How did people just stumble upon mushrooms? So like I'll eat this, right? And how it changes your brain and the stigma. You know, people are scared about psychedelic drugs the same way they are about dark arts, mm -hmm. even though there's no like apparent. It's just mystical and it's awesome, but mm -hmm. there's no reason. And of course, you have to be careful with it. Just yeah, like yeah. Mm -hmm. But people are too afraid. So I want to. Yeah. I want to take this to a conclusion because um, I really don't want to get cut off by Zoom. Okay. <laughs> that, that sucks when that happens. So um, I really appreciate you doing this for me. I really appreciate yeah. it. Awesome My pleasure. Talk. And um, I'm sure a lot of people will appreciate this. You're a really interesting dude. Uh, dark arts are awesome. I really, one of these days, man, I want to get one of your arts. Like everyone who I interview, I want to get something to remember them. Oh. Like Callum Rooney. I've got a poster from him from a, cool. a gig I went to. And uh, I don't know if you know, um, what's his name? What's his name? What's his name? Uh, Ed Binkley. Oh, no way. That's so yeah, funny. I'm, try I'm trying to get it. Poster. I'm trying to get on the, him on the pod, my podcast this Damn, week. <laughs> same. He's not responding to my emails, man. Please, <laughs> please. I would love to have you on. But um, yeah, he's amazing. So thank you so much. Um, Dark my Arts pleasure. are incredible. Check out um, viewers. Check out Mr. Star's work. It's, it's really awesome. Really it's eye-opening and um, i'm referring to the tool poster with the dude pushing his fingers into his eyes or into his yeah into his eyes with the big eye oh uh -huh, yeah <laughs> eye-opening it's great and um leave it behind leave but baggage behind i think that's the whole moral of the story here mm -hmm. it's forge your own way yeah do whatever the hell you want to do make the world a better place you know you're vegetarian you're, you're you are making the world a better place you are i'm not that strong yet maybe one day yeah um, it took me a while it took yeah. i didn't do it till i was 17 it took me three tries <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah we have less than a minute i don't want to get cut off thank you so much man i really appreciate this and um, my pleasure hope we'll talk again man yeah when you get big and famous youtuber make sure not don't forget me bring me back on we'll, we'll meet in person okay all right sounds good <laughs> okay have a good day all right you too